Um, it's interesting that we spent the last session actually doing a lot of trying to predict the future. You know, who's going to be dominant in the, the, the 21st century? And I think actually as a species, humans spend a lot of time uh, looking into the future, trying to predict things. I think we're almost unique as a species. I don't know if you have pets, but my cat definitely doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to happen in six years' time. And I think actually it's uh, a consequence consequence of consciousness. Consciousness actually gives us the ability to sort of do mental time travel. Uh, and actually, uh, through our development as a species, we found that there's one language in particular which gives us this amazing power to predict the future, and that subject is mathematics. And what I want to do in this presentation is show you somehow, sometimes the power of mathematics to look into the future and make predictions. Um, if you think about climate change, that really is a mathematical problem, trying to see the data that we have at the moment, trying to understand what's going to happen next. Anyone who works in a hedge fund here will be absolutely trying to see what the data is doing and predict what's going to happen next. Um, oh, what's the spread of viruses across the world? That's also modeling that and trying to predict before you can see what you can do to control it. Again, it's a very mathematical problem. And I think that actually that if I had to define what a mathematician is, I would probably define a mathematician as a pattern searcher. I think that that's what I do every day in my office at the Maths Institute in Oxford, is I, I try and look for patterns, try and look for structure, logic, in the kind of chaotic, messy world we have around us. Um, uh, I think uh, most of my friends think I'm doing long division for all the decimal places. Uh, surely I'll be put out of a job by a computer by now. But, um, um, so I tried to impress on them that no, that's really what we are at heart of pattern searches. So I'm going to kick off and try and warm you up, your mathematical part of your brain, uh, with a few challenges for you. Some patterns that I want you to look at and see whether you can predict the future. Where is this pattern going to go next? Uh, so you probably remember these a little bit at school, where you've got given a sequence of numbers, and what you had to try and do was to work out the logic behind that sequence of numbers so you could predict what was going to happen next. Um, so they start off quite easy, but um, we'll start to push you towards the end. So um, if I take the first sequence, um, uh, can we spot the pattern here and predict where it's going to go? 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. 36. Very good. What well, you answer 35. You've got an interesting answer. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. 36. Um, so what you do is you're adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Um, so these are actually called the triangular numbers, um, and you can view them very geometrically. One of the big games in maths is to change things, sometimes from geometry into numbers, numbers into geometry. Actually, if you consider them geometrically, it's the number of stones you need to build a triangle as you add an extra layer on each time. Actually, if you want to work out the hundredth triangular number, for example, well, you can do it with kind of a stupid way, which is to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. But uh, mathematicians were absolutely useless at mental arithmetic. I mean, don't ask a mathematician to divide the bill at the end of a meal. But, uh, so, so we actually like um, shortcuts, and we, we're, we're pretty lazy at art as well. Mathematicians like to find fast ways to do things. And actually, there's a nice formula that you can produce. If you put two triangles together, you get the shape of a rectangle. Well, counting things in a rectangle is easy. You just divide that by two, and you get a formula for, a tri for the triangular numbers. So that gives us a way to work out the hundredth triangular number, the billionth triangular number, without having to do all the hard work. And that's often the tool of mathematics enables you to make these shortcuts into solving a problem. So we know a lot about these triangular numbers. Okay, um, uh, well, if you've got a maths degree, you might not be allowed to play this uh, on these first lots. So, um, uh, also, if you've read the Da Vinci Code, you're not allowed to play on this one either. Um, but if you haven't read the Da Vinci Code, what's the next number in this sequence? 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. 34. 34, yes. This is a very famous sequence, um, one of the first things you had to crack in the Da Vinci Code. Um, these are a very famous sequence of cut numbers called the Fibonacci numbers. Um, you had to add the two previous numbers together to get the next one in the sequence. So you had 13 and 21, you get to 34. And these are really nature's favorite numbers. You find them all over the natural world. Uh, Fibonacci uh, wrote about them in the famous uh, book he wrote uh, in the 12th, 13th century, uh, because he discovered them just hiding in lots of natural growth processes. And in a sense, these numbers have uh, growth embedded in them. They grow from the two previous numbers, you get the next number in the sequence. Um, so, for example, if you take a flower and you count the number of petals in that flower, then invariably it's a number in the Fibonacci sequence. 
And if it isn't a number in the Fibonacci sequence, then that's because a petal has fallen off your flower. Which is uh, how mathematicians get round exceptions. Um, uh, so, uh, but actually, we, we know quite a lot about these numbers. We also have a, a, a beautiful formula which can help to calculate the hundredth Fibonacci number without having to add all the numbers up in pairs all the way up to 100. It involves this magic number, the golden ratio, which expresses kind of the perfect proportions in parts of nature. There's a lot we don't understand about these numbers as well. Lots of mysteries still um, left. One of the interesting things as well is that um, a lot of people think the mathematics uh, uh, started in the ancient Greeks and then there was kind of like a, uh, uh, a thousand years where nothing happened and then Fibonacci came along and suddenly math started in Europe. Actually, these numbers were first discovered in Asia. It was discovered in India a um, hundred years before Fibonacci ever discovered them. And interestingly, they weren't discovered by mathematicians or scientists, but by musicians and poets who realized that these numbers actually count the number of rhythms that you can create with long and short beats. Um, so it's interesting that uh, Asia is responsible for um, a, a, a huge amount of mathematics which developed really from the ancient Greeks up to when Fibonacci started and mathematics up in Europe. In fact, uh, some of you came along and uh, gave me a, a book which is called The Nine Chapters, of, uh, which some of you may know is a very, very seminal text uh, in China which deals with a lot of, um, sort of mathematical problems. So, so a lot has been going on here. Um, okay, the next sequence. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16... Now, actually, 31 is the next number in this sequence. Um, 32 seems a very obvious choice. It seems like you're doubling numbers each time. Um, but here's a little warning. This is a little bit like looking at the 20th century and thinking by 2014 that Argentina will be the, the great dominant power. And they're realizing that things can veer off in a completely different direction. Um, so actually, let me explain to you why uh, 31 is an equally good answer to the way that these numbers develop. Because these numbers are actually describing something called the circle division numbers. So what are those? Well, if I take a circle and I put one point in that circle, then I have just have one region. But if I now have a second point and join those up, well, now I've got two regions in that circle. Let's put another point in, join all the points up. I've got a little triangle in the middle and four or three regions around the outside, making a total of four regions. Okay, we put another point in, you get this nice little envelope shape, four triangles, four regions around the outside, eight regions. Now you think, okay, I've got enough data to be able to predict what's going to happen next. Pattern seems to be developing, put a point on, seems to double each time, so you put another point on, and sure enough, you get this lovely five-pointed star, the pentagons uh, in there, and again, 16 regions. So you, you think, oh, this is absolutely certain, you start to try to prove that it doubles each time. But when you put on a sixth point, however you arrange them, the maximum number of regions you'll get is 31 regions. Um, you sometimes get fewer of this kind of merge. But uh, so, uh, utterly surprising, it isn't doubling, which is, it is working here. And actually, it's one of the fun things in maths, actually. What makes maths exciting are these kind of surprises that lay out there. There's something you think is doing something like boring and sort of conventional doubling, and then it does something completely different. Uh, we have a formula which counts the number of regions. You have to take this what and the number of uh, regions. But, but again, this insight gives us that we actually, when you have established the pattern, um, then actually we can say you know, how many regions will there be with 100 points. And this is the kind of thing that will come up in a sort of uh, data analysis. If you're trying to partition a region, you want to know what the maximum number of regions you'll get. And it isn't um, doubling. So, so a warning here, there are supplies out there, and I'm sure anyone who's trying to predict things um, in the hedge funds has really realized that sometimes you think something might be stabilizing and then it can do something quite interesting. Um, uh, so maybe it's a cortic polynomial you're after in the hedge funds. But, um, okay, what about this next thing? It's a little bit more challenging. If you've got an math degree, you can now join in. So um, 2, 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. Didn't we all so vocal on the previous ones? <laughs> Oh, Fibonacci numbers, I don't know about them. <laughs> Anyone spot any pattern in order to predict where this is going to get next? Well, if you could get that 26 was the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it by the lottery. Um, because the lottery is a bit winning, so when you pay, it's only going to September. So, um, there's another warning on everything has patterns. <laughs> You have to choose your battles carefully, and that's a good warning. Although I'll show you a little later on that even when things are random, um, there is a chance to make some predictions. Unfortunately, I don't have a formula for these numbers. If I did, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be endowing uh, some wonderful professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford, sitting on my top of the line and enjoying myself. So, uh, uh, okay, so, uh, so a warning: not everything has patterns. 
Um, what about the next sequence? 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19. 23, what are these numbers? Prime numbers, exactly. And uh, these are probably the most important numbers in the whole of mathematics. In my research, I spent a lot of time trying to understand these numbers. They also represent the, the biggest mystery in our subject. So these numbers are the indivisible numbers. As I tell my uh, kids, they're the numbers which don't appear in any other multiplication table except their own. Um, and they're so important, so most kids know about this, but they don't know why they're important. They're important because they're the, literally the, the building blocks of the whole of mathematics. If I take a number like 105, is that a prime number? No, no clearly not. It's divisible by 5, so I get down to 21 times 5, 21 prime? Three. No, 3 times 7, but now I've got down to these indivisible numbers. So 3, 5, and 7, I can't divide those anymore. So these are the primes which build that number 105. And you can do this with any number. So you take your telephone number. Um, uh, I do have a prime number telephone number, which then I'm very envious because I've been working very hard all my life to find a prime number telephone number. All I get is even numbers. Um, uh, but if it isn't a prime number, then you can divide it and you can keep on dividing until at some point you'll get down to a, a, a string of indivisible numbers, the primes which build that number. So for me, I call them the atoms of arithmetic. They are as important as the atoms in chemistry. Now, probably the most fundamental thing in chemistry, um, or on every chemistry lab wall, is the periodic table, the thing from which you can build raw molecules. For me, the primes in mathematics are like the hydrogen and oxygen, the sodium and chlorine of the world of mathematics. And it's interesting, this uh, table, uh, again, it was mathematics which hides behind this table, which uh, Mendeleev saw a pattern, was able to arrange the atoms, and then make predictions for new atoms inside there. So the, the, the mathematics of prediction working at heart to create the periodic table. But for mathematicians, we're still pretty challenged. We do not have yet a sort of periodic table of primes. Uh, we don't seem to understand any patterns inside these primes. Now, here's a question for you. Who do you think were the first to discover the primes? Any ideas? Who do you think were the first to discover the primes? Any idea? Yes, how Ancient Egypt is a very good um, a choice because ancient Egypt is responsible for, for some of the very first mathematics that was ever done. I mean, uh, if you look at the Rhine papyrus, for example, you find a formula um, for the volume of the pyramid there um, using some very early sorts of calculus um, where they sort of divide the pyramid up into infinite layers. Um, clearly, they needed to know how many stones there were, and, uh, and they were one of the first to do pi because they taxed areas of land and the Nile curved out. Um, uh, circular regions, and they think pi was necessary to know what the area of that uh, piece of land was. But it wasn't the Egyptian, they don't find the primes in, in any of the primes. The Arabs. The Arabs, um, the Arabs are actually pretty late on the scene as far as mathematics is concerned, but they were very dominant in, in, in developing the sort of theory of algebra. Um, and, uh, but, but no primes weren't really there, so it was a. India. India. In, Tons of great mass there. They probably did the calculus before Newton and Leibniz did. Um, there's evidence of a school in Kerala uh, which was developing an early form of calculus even before Newton and Leibniz. They, they gave us the zero. Um, zero was first uh, uh, created in seventh century India. We didn't have it before that, but those primes were first there. China. China. You might think I'm teeing you up to say China, but no. Uh, <laughs> uh, they also did fantastic mathematics as well, but uh, no, in fact, was an insect. <laughs> an insect was the first to discover primes way before mathematicians came on the scene. And this insect has an incredibly strange life cycle. It's a cicada. Now, you have cicadas across the world, but these very special mathematical cicadas, this shows the dominance of um, uh, America um, in, in the very early mathematics. It is, these are in North America. You don't find them anywhere else, but they hide underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. And then on the 17th year, they emerge en masse into the forest. Absolutely extraordinary behavior. Um, almost on the same day, they can feel the warmth of that 17th year. They emerge uh, out of the ground. They, they party away. Um, this is the sound of one of these cicadas. Um, You've got to multiply this by um, uh, several million of these. Um, the sound of the forest is so unbearable that residents generally move out because it's just terrible. There's even a website for planning your wedding, and you can check to see whether these cicadas are appearing that year in order to avoid um, planning your wedding for that period. They pass away, they, they eat the leaves, they uh, mate, uh, they, uh, they eggs, and then after six weeks of partying, 
they all die, and the forest gets quiet again for another 17 years before the next generation appears out of the ground. I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary life cycle. First of all, how does the these surprises actually count for 17? I mean, uh, uh, unbelievable. I mean, there's nothing in the natural cycle which has a 17-year cycle to it. So um, uh, biologists are quite uh, uh, stumped by sort of what it is that they're doing. They very rarely appear a year early or a year late. Now, for 17, it's a, it's a prime number, an indivisible number. So it's my favorite number, actually, because it's the number I played for in my football team as well. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I thought it might give me some, because uh, the key to this, it seems, uh, is that this number 17 does seem to be something special about it being prime. Because uh, if you go to other areas in North America, I went actually a couple of years ago uh, doing a film for the BBC, and we went to the Nashville area, and there there's another species of cicada which appears periodically, but they take 13 years before they appear. And that, it was so exciting to see these cicadas I mean, coming out from the ground, knowing that they've been there for 30 years. We, we talked to a resident there, um, uh, there was a, a guy who was serving us in, in the restaurant, and he said, it's so exciting. The last time I saw these, I was a kid. Um, and they wait 13 years, and they will have the next brood as well. So, but you never find any with a 12, 14, 15, 16, or 18 year life cycle. Absolutely extraordinary. So what is it about the primes which seems to be helping these cicadas? Well, it seems to be the key to their evolutionary survival, because uh, we're not quite sure, but we think that there might be a predator that also used to appear periodically in the forest. And the predator would try and time its arrival to coincide with the cicada. And now the cicadas have had a prime number life cycle, found that they can keep out of sync much better from this predator than the cicadas with a non-prime number life cycle. Uh, let's suppose, for example, the uh, predator um, appears every uh, six years in the forest. Now let's take a cicada which appears every nine years. Well, six and nine are both divisible by three. So already by year 18, the cicada meets the predator um, and it gets wiped out. Um, so but what if we change the life cycle to a seven-year life cycle? Let's make the cicada appear every seven years. Well, it's appearing more often in the forest, so you might think, well, well it's going to get to meet the predator more often. But no, because now seven is prime, the predator and the cicada keep out of sync, so they don't meet until year 42. So the cicada with a prime number life cycle has a much better chance of surviving. And it seems in some of these forests in North America that there was a real competition. The, the predator shifts to try and coincide with the cicada, finds the prime, the cicada has to move its life cycle, finds a new prime, um, and in this forest with 17 years, and the cicada seems to have known its rats, the predator didn't, um, died out, good message, know your rats in this world, you survive. Um, and uh, the cicada seems to be linked with this prime number life cycle, um, with this number 17. So actually, the, the, the cicadas are the first to realize the power of the primes um, as key to their evolutionary survival. Um, but it's actually probably the ancient Greeks, um, who none of you mentioned, um, as, as the first to really prove the first great theorems about the primes. And uh, in particular, Euclid. Euclid showed that um, if we try and do the same thing as the chemists and produce a table with all of our uh, sort of atoms, or, or, no, all the primes in a big long table, then unfortunately we'll be, we'll, we'll be writing forever. Because uh, Euclid was able to prove with a beautiful little logical argument that the primes never run out. There are infinitely many of these primes. Um, so, so we've got a much tougher task than the chemists. Um, uh, we only had 109 chemical elements stable on their periodic table. We have to understand infinitely many of these numbers. And they're so fundamental because they're the building blocks of my subject. So, so how do we do that? Well, we try and look for patterns of these numbers. But at the moment, it's probably our greatest unsolved problem. Um, uh, if you look at a sequence of primes, I've written them as a heartbeat here. Um, so the heart beats every time it runs over a prime number. And I really think that primes like the heartbeats of my subject. Um, well, th this seems to be a subject which needs to visit the cardiac department because it doesn't know when it's going to beat next. I mean, you have two beats and a big pause and a single beat, then another big pause and two beats. And actually, if you look at these numbers, um, it seems to be terribly difficult as we go higher and higher through the universe of numbers to predict when that half is going to be next. To give you an example, um, if I want to say uh, a triangular number with a billion digits, very easy, I just use my formula. But this is the largest prime number we have so far discovered. Uh, we know there are many of these, but this is the biggest one we can find so far. 
uh, and it's pretty big. Um, it has 17 million digits. Uh, if I read those out aloud to you, we'd be here for two months. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to do that. So, uh, you can express it very uh, succinctly. You can take 2 to the power of 57,885,161. That's very divisible. Take one off that number and send me, we get an indivisible number, one of these prime numbers. And interestingly, this wasn't discovered by uh, a professional mathematician, but it's by an amateur uh, who downloaded a piece of software that's available online. And you can get your computer, actually my computer at the moment is running this little program in the background, uh, looking for these big primes, uh, applying an algorithm that we know that helps us to look for these special primes called Merzen primes. And actually, there, there's money available for anybody who, who, who breaks the next record. Um, if you pass the 100 million digit mark, then there's actually $150,000 out there for anybody who breaks that. And a uh, million digits, you can get $200,000. Uh, Although probably the electricity bill will run up. Um, <laughs> trying to run the program will be more than uh, the prize that you'll get. Um, uh, but I think this really sums up uh, actually how little we know about the primes. We know that there ain't been many of them, but this is the big, we don't know where they are after this. Yet they go on uh, endlessly throughout the universe of numbers. So, in fact, if we look at uh, the, the prime numbers, in mathematics we have a sense that there's much more in common uh, between the prime numbers and the lottery ticket numbers, than between the primes and the, the Fibonacci or triangular numbers. The primes seem to have embedded in them a sort of inherent randomness which we're trying to understand. In fact, the, our greatest unsolved problem is something called the Riemann hypothesis, which is trying to explain why the primes outwardly look so random. And there are a lot of us in Oxford um, studying number theory who are trying to unlock this great mystery. In fact, uh, uh, the Clay Foundation, which helped us build our, our wonderful new building in Oxford, which I all encourage you to come and visit, uh, the Clay Foundation um, set seven uh, what they call the millennium problems um, at the beginning of this millennium. Seven great unsolved problems of mathematics. And the first one on the list um, is this thing, the Riemann hypothesis. And there's a, actually a million dollar prize out there uh, for anybody who can understand the secret of these numbers. But frankly, I think most mathematicians, I, I would certainly pay a million dollars and give my soul as well for anybody who would uh, show me the proof of this. Um, uh, so there's, uh, but even when things are random, um, it's interesting that you can still use mathematics to say some things about it. Actually, for, for many um, centuries, people regarded the randomness of a dice, for example, as something that mathematics could have no say over. But it was actually uh, Fadamar and Pascal who began to realize, no, you can even apply mathematics to things which are random. So I'm going to do a little experiment with you. You've all got your lottery forms uh, in, in front of you. I think some of you thought I was going to give you some maths exam. Uh, there was a lot of uh, quaking over here, uh, sort of um, uh, whether I would have to, you had to do some arithmetic. But all I'm going to get you asked you to do um, is to pick six numbers. We're going to do a little mini lottery in here um, at the alumni weekend. And I'll, I'm going to show you how mathematics can help to make predictions about what, at first sight, looks like a totally random process. Um, so what I want you to do is to choose six numbers. So the UK lottery um, in England, so we have numbers from 1 to 49. And you just have to choose uh, six numbers at random. Um, and then we will run a little lottery and we'll see. Very, unfortunately, I don't have a big monetary prize for you. So if you do get all six numbers right, um, what a waste. Do um, <laughs> you know the weekend when somebody's offering millions of uh, dollars or something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just the honor of getting as close as you can. So, um, uh, so are you all ready? Um, I'm going to uh, get, uh, so this is all independent. I'll get uh, some of you, why don't the Chancellor uh, kick off choose one number for us. Oh, lucky number eight. Well, there you go. That's um, yeah, a very good choice uh, in this region. So um, let's uh, choose another one. 49, square of a prime, so no one's cube of a prime, 30, I haven't got any here, yeah, so 24, okay, do uh, one more, and what have we got, 32, this is like pairs of two here, and number 13, right, okay, ah, interesting, so, um, let me repeat those for you. Uh, I, I bought some eggs this morning in order to be able to. Um, right, so let's uh, get these in order. So we've got 8, 13, 24, 30, 32, and 49. Okay. So I'm going to make a few predictions. Okay. Now I'd like you all to stand up. 
Um, at this point in the lecture, I'm usually getting very sleepy, and uh, uh, so I want you to all wave your lottery tickets in the air, get some blood running through your body, that's great, get the mind thinking again, and now uh, I'm going to make a prediction that half of you, half of you, I've already heard a lot of them, but I believe that half of you, the mathematics says that half of you should have not got any numbers right at all, so please sit down if you've got no numbers right at all, um, and let's see whether... <laughs> Yeah, I think that's pretty, yeah, I think that's a roughly uh, 50 50 split. Um, uh, now, uh, how many of you got uh, two numbers right? Um, well, uh, okay, I want you to, uh, I would say it's a one in eight chance of you, so, so maybe we're getting back at about uh, 25, 30. So please sit down if you only got one number right, and let's see whether we've got 20. Ooh, gosh, okay, a bit fewer then. So the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I'm uh, tending towards 20, but uh, that's pretty good. Now I would predict maybe about only three of you got three or more numbers right. So please sit down. So it was a one, one in eight chance. So sit down if you only got two numbers right. I, su I suggest there was. Oh, oh, no, 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 don't feel shy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so we've got uh, two people still got three numbers right. So, so that uh, so roughly one in fifty. I'd say you're, you're slightly unlucky. We would su suspect so three or four maybe with the numbers you've got now. But uh, I would suspect you probably haven't got four numbers right. So sit down if you've got only three numbers right. Okay, yeah. Because a uh, thousand people here, then then there'd be a chance of one of you. The math says that one of you out of a thousand um, will get. Um, so, so next time we have the alumni weekend, we'll have a thousand of you here. Um, uh, and we'll get one of you getting four numbers right. Of course. Five numbers, that's getting pretty rare. Um, we have to have 55,000 uh, of you. Um, that would be the third alumni weekend. Um, and uh, to, for one of you to get all of the numbers right, I think well, we'll have to have the whole of Hong Kong coming twice um, in order to be able to get all six numbers right. So, so um, the math's going to help you to predict, and that's of course how the lottery decides how the money is going to be laid out. So they need to know how many people are going to get each one. Now, to give you a sense of these numbers, because uh, when numbers get big, we tend to all think that they are infinite. Um, uh, so uh, suppose you bought a lottery ticket uh, every week, just one lottery ticket every week. So um, after about a year, you might have got one with three numbers right. Um, okay, so to get four numbers right, how long will that take? Well, that's 20 years. 20 years you've got a lottery ticket every week. Um, uh, what about five numbers right? Well, uh, if King Alfred had started, um, he would have may have won, but got five numbers right. Um, to, to get all six numbers right, if the first thought the first Homo sapien had was, I must buy a lottery ticket. He went down and got a lottery ticket every week. Um, he might have won, or she might have won once um, over that period. So that gives you a sense of the scale of these numbers. Um, now, I can't use mathematics to be able to predict. I don't have a formula which will say what those numbers came out. But as you can use mathematics to help you to avoid what happens in the ninth week of the National Lottery in the UK. Because in the ninth week of the National Lottery, Something rather bizarre happened. 133 people got all six numbers right. Wow, a miserable week to win. I mean, you're, you're sitting on your settee at home watching the numbers come out. Well, yes, I'm a millionaire. You phone up and find you've got to share it. There are 132 people. So they ended up playing with £100,000 each. Uh, so what happened that week? Was it a lot of um, employees of the uh, company that runs it who were playing? Uh, no, actually what happened is it's evidence of the fact that actually humans we're so addicted to patterns, actually most of us on mathematical part, we tend to leave patterns wherever we go. When we choose numbers, we tend to put patterns in there. Of course, it's what everyone's taking advantage of in this digital age. The numerati are going to be the, uh, it's not Asia, it's anybody who's numerate, which probably means that Asia, that's why I voted for Asia, Asia really values mathematics in a way that uh, I think we don't in Europe. And being able to read those numbers and the data is going to give you an edge in being able to predict what customer is going to do next, what health is going to happen, uh, the, the trends in health. And, and this is what happened, you see, because people put lots of structure in these numbers. When people choose numbers randomly, they tend to space them out very nicely. They don't cluster them. So that week, they were all nicely, evenly spaced out. Um, so uh, I, I'm kind of curious to see how, how random you got on. Um, so uh, I, I want you to stand up if you chose two consecutive numbers in your choice of numbers. 17, 18, 13, 31. Um, okay, so that's uh, very interesting. Okay, if you have gen genuinely, yeah, so if you've got two consecutive numbers, two numbers, uh, one after the other. Say again. So what do you, 
What did you choose? Three, that's right. Yeah, sorry, I, that's, this is a mathematician at heart. He's asked, and then I had two. And actually, I've got three. So, at least two. <laughs> I, I thoroughly approve of this uh, technicality. There are at least two numbers which are consecutive. Um, uh, so, actually, this shows how, how addicted to patterns you are, because half of you, half of you should be standing now, because half of the numbers that could come out of this uh, box um, had two consecutive numbers. And in fact, if you look at the previous week, 21 and 22 came out. In the following week, 30 and 31 came out. And half of the numbers that I was proud of, it, it, this time we didn't get any consecutive numbers, but if we run it again, there's an even chance that you'll get two consecutive numbers. Um, okay, uh, sit down, but set, keep standing if you chose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> These, these are the true mathematicians in the room. Because they know that this is as likely as anything else. So your neighbor is looking and saying, oh, one, two, three, five, five, six, isn't going to come out of there? Um, of course, the clear number won't as well. So, so congratulations for having a very mathematical choice. Uh, you can sit down, but I advise you not to choose these numbers. Because in the UK, uh, certainly, 10,000 people a week choose one, two, three, five, six. So you'll be sharing your winnings with a, a, a huge number of people. So, and that's why I think it's, it's just nice to show how intelligent the UK population actually is. Because they realise that that's as likely as anything else. In other words, incredibly unlikely. But actually, if you are going to play the lottery, this is a tactic. Um, because if you can go against the trend, and of course that's key in any sort of business development, what you want to do is to, to go against people's intuition, which is probably wrong. People attack, people's intuition about probability is notoriously bad. So if you understand the maths, you can go against that and make a, a killing. Because if you cluster your numbers together, so plump them, but don't use this plump thing, um, then you're more likely to, when you win, to walk away with everything rather than having to share it, as happened in the ninth week of the National Lottery. So I think it's amazing that mathematics has this power, even when things are random, to, to have a lot of control and make predictions, and, and quite counterintuitive predictions. Um, but there are some regions of the natural world where mathematics is having great difficulty making predictions. Um, we have the equations to understand these processes, but they have a, a, a very special bit of mathematics, which was discovered in the 20th century, which is causing us a lot of problems. And that's the chaotic behavior that we find in many natural phenomena. So chaos theory um, is it, it, actually a warning to us about the power of mathematics to make predictions. Because Henri Poincaré, who was probably the, the person who first discovered um, chaos at the beginning of the 20th century, great French uh, mathematician, he was trying to understand a problem which seemed in, in, at its heart, to be a reasonably straightforward problem, which is, um, if you look at the solar system, is our solar system stable? Will our solar system just keep on doing the same thing? I mean, it seems incredibly regular. We seem to be able to predict when we'll have eclipses and things like that, uh, way into the future. But are we sure that at some point the solar system won't just suddenly fly apart? Uh, well, we think it is very stable, and partly that was reinforced by Newton, who could prove that if you had two bodies, the, the laws of motion show that two bodies will just do ellipses around each other till the end of time. We'll just no same patterns. But if you throw three bodies in there, then Newton was totally thrown. He couldn't solve this. He couldn't solve this uh, equations of motion. And by the way, he started to look at three bodies in a solar system. Um, and he saw that there was some, if you set things up very carefully, you could have some uh, structures which certainly did uh, patterns repeat themselves at the end of time. So like these three bodies doing ellipses. But what he discovered, actually, is if you make just a very small approximation, a small error in the position of one of those planets. Um, so here's a, a similar system which looks like it's stable, but after a very small while, um, the, the, uh, this planet uh, starts to do something that you really don't want to be living in this solar system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and it, all of its cause was a very small change in one of the locations of those planets, and, and they go flying off. So it was a real challenge. Uh, Poincaré couldn't answer the problem of whether our solar system is stable. What he discovered was it's incredibly sensitive to initial conditions. So knowing the precise location of each of those planets, um, uh, well, if you knew the precise location, you'd be fine. You could run the equation and see what could happen. But even a small change in a, just one decimal place of one of those planets, um, we certainly don't know the precise uh, position of all the planets. Uh, we know it pretty accurately. But we've done computer models that have shown, actually, 
Um, there's one planet which could be responsible for our solar system flying apart. Anyone like to guess which planet is going to cause the solar system to fly apart? The sun, actually, well, that's interesting. No, the sun is pretty stable. Um, it, it, it's, it's the fact, I mean, I wouldn't say the sun's a planet. I mean, really Pluto. <laughs> Pluto. Which one? Jupiter. Jupiter? No, it's not Jupiter. You might think it is Jupiter because that's a whacking great thing um, which could have a big influence on the solar system. Pluto. Uh, Pluto, not Pluto. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thought. Uh, no one said Earth yet because we're going to cause such a mess. But you're going to say Earth? Uh, no, it's actually Mercury. Mercury, which is one of the smallest planets. Again, uh, Pluto is quite a good suggestion. It's the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> Something small, but it, it, we've run computer models which have uh, slightly altered uh, where we think, we're not quite sure exactly uh, precise location of Mercury, but if we do a little bit of uh, uh, change the coordinates a little bit, uh, there, there's a 5% chance that um, 5% of the, uh, the runs see Mercury starting. It's, Jupiter is a good choice in some ways because there's a resonance which uh, could happen with Jupiter and Mercury will suddenly start to intersect the um, uh, orbit of Venus, at which point Venus gets pulled off and then crashes into Earth and the whole of our solar system flies apart. 5% um, chance that's going to happen. Um, but don't worry, not in our lifetime, but very likely, that, so the computer models say that that's probably beyond when the sun will run out of fuel and uh, we'll all be consumed by the sun. So, uh, um, but it's, it's very interesting. So, a lot of what uh, this idea of chaos theory is in, in, philosophically very deep because it means that um, uh, can we really know the, how our universe is set up and we'll be able to make predictions into the future? Oh. And, and chaos theory actually crops up in, in some what look like incredibly simple settings. So, for example, a pendulum. A pendulum we, we use to keep track of time, it's so regular. But if I change the pendulum very slightly, so here I've got uh, what's called a double pendulum. So it's just two pieces of metal uh, uh, hinged together, so it's a little bit like a leg. Um, we know the equations for these, a very simple bit of uh, mechanics can write down the equations, but to be able to predict the behavior of this thing, uh, it, it is it's incredibly difficult. So, um, you know, <laughs> being able to predict even when it's finished or which way it's going to go around, or even to repeat the behavior. So, if I try and um, estimate, even though I put a mark on here and try to set it off at exactly the same point, <laughs> well, it certainly didn't do that the first time. Um, this is my favorite desktop toy. I've been playing this for absolutely hours. So, uh, let's start to, to do another one, okay? I mean, that, that, that is uh, chaos in action. I mean, be able to put it, uh, uh, it's a thing of music. But, uh, uh, so that's the trouble. You can, uh, you, you can have the equations, but a very small change can mean that the behavior can be completely different. It'll end up going anti-clockwise the last time and clockwise. There's another lovely desktop toy, uh, which some of you may have on, uh, on your desk. It's, uh, you have uh, three magnets and a pendulum which swings between the magnets. You let the pendulum off and it, it tends towards one of the magnets. This is also it's a bit like an asteroid flying around three planets and which asteroid, which planet is going to get hit. Um, this is again incredibly sensitive. I, I did uh, uh, three computer runs of, of, of where the, the pendulum will end up. And you, you see they almost start at the same place, but they just very slightly changed one of the decimal places of the coordinates where it started. The first one ended up at the blue magnet, the second one at the red magnet, the third one at the yellow magnet, with just that small change. And an absolutely dramatic difference in the outcome. Because so, you know, it's a, uh, only three choices. Um, here is a computer simulation of where the pendulum will end up. So if you start over a yellow region, then the pendulum ends at the yellow magnet. So there are certainly regions which are entirely predictable. If you're near the yellow magnet, the other magnets don't have any power to be able to pull it across. So it just wobbles and stays in the yellow magnet. So you see that large region of yellow. Um, but then there are other regions where, uh, this is an example of something called a fractal which you might have heard of. A fractal is a, a geometric shape discovered in the 20th century which has infinite complexity. So as you zoom in on this shape, it never gets simpler. There's never a sunny, a, a big yellow region there. So um, and when I started my pendulum, it is up in the sort of top left-hand corner. And that region there, um, if you zoomed in, you just continually see red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue. And um, just a small change can take you from a yellow region to a red region uh, and end up being somewhere completely different. Now, the equations, for example, of the weather are, are very much like these equations. They have the same sort of property. And so there are some regions in the world where the weather is incredibly predictable. 
And that's like living in a region with sort of near the yellow magnet. You've made a small change in the weather, really doesn't do anything new. But there are other regions like the UK, I don't know where the hot one is, it's cloudy yesterday, lovely today, it's probably similar, where if you, you, know, you can get all the data uh, available from all the weather stations, uh, but just a small change in some of that data can cause you to go from a, a yellow region where it's cloudy, uh, suddenly to a red region where you get a lovely day, or a blue region where it's suddenly raining. And that's the trouble with the weather. I've been along to the Met Office, we did some filming down there, and they showed us some simulations um, in the U of UK weather. And they took, they, they take the data from the weather stations, um, <coughs> run, make small perturbations of that weather, and run it several thousand times. And you can see, five days, the predictions keep quite close. But after five days, it suddenly just starts going in completely different directions. And that's why our weather really only, there's only um, some sort of correspondence between all of these things for five days. And after five days, we have really very little control on the sort of local weather. Because this is an example of something which you've probably heard of, the butterfly effect. Um, that, and this is very important in any particular system that you're looking at. Is it going to be so sensitive that a small change could cause a, a massively different outcome? And I think it's important to know when you will be able to predict things. Uh, another good example of this is a billiard table. If I shoot a billiard ball off on a table, it will bounce around and make a, a particular path. If I make a small change in the angle that I'm sending the ball off, it will do a very similar path. But if I change the shape of the billiard table and put two um, uh, uh, semicircles at the end of the table and make a sort of stadium shape, the game completely changes. Then chaos starts to kick in. You get this butterfly effect. Very small change in the angle that you're sending your ball off, the path does something completely different. So it's very important to know when you're in a region where you can use maps to make predictions and when you can't. There's another very interesting uh, area where this um, sort of mathematics applies, which is it's very important. Um, uh, it's a biology, which is population growth. Trying to make predictions about the, what populations of uh, animals will do from year to year um, seems to be also very sensitive. Um, to, to these initial conditions. Now I've got a little question for you. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a particular species which has a very strange kind of population dynamics. I want you to, to vote for which one you think it is. Um, which of these animals do you think the theory has been developed that there's a species of animal, of animal which throws itself over a cliff in a mass suicide pact every four years? This is the explanation given for why every four years this species of animal just seems to disappear. Um, for, from the local area. So um, any votes for muskrats being the, um, the species which disappears every four years? You, any mus you got a couple of votes for muskrat team? Um, okay, uh, one of them. Um, vol voles? Who thinks voles are the ones that disappear? We've um, got uh, a few votes for voles, not quite there. How about lemmings? Who thinks lemmings uh, disappear every four years? Oh, yes, look at that. Lots of lemmings. Oh, yes. Oh, he put up his hand. Oh, all right, tonight, lemmings, exactly. That's where we get this expression from, uh, which is uh, this belief that when one lemming throws itself over the cliff, suddenly all the others start streaming after it, which is where this expression. I don't know when you played that computer game. I used to love that computer game where you had to leave one lemming and all the others would follow and sort of uh, fall off the cliff. Um, yes, indeed. Um, there, there, there is, uh, it seems that the lemming population every four years just plummets and disappears. And we tried to come up with some explanation for this. And, and so this explanation came up, but um, they seem to be uh, throwing themselves over a cliff, which seems crazy theory, until um, Walt Disney went out. They used to make nature programs. You probably remember some, some of these nature programs. And they sent a team out um, to look at the lemmings in the wild. And this team of uh, this camera crew actually managed to capture the lemmings throwing themselves over the cliff. Um, so here's the footage. Um, uh, so, so they managed to, uh, I don't know where the cameraman was to that. He must be hanging off the side of the, uh, uh, but they, they, they saw these lemmings coming up to the side of the cliff, um, ocean there, and so off they go. So throwing themselves over the side of the cliff. Absolutely extraordinary. Certain death in bottom, nowhere to go, they all got drowned. Um, uh, so it seemed like the theory was proved. There's one man who really doesn't want to go. This is a very bad idea, guys. But uh, uh, over he goes as well. Um, uh, so, so it seemed like this theory had been proved that, uh, uh, that they did have this strange behavior. A few years ago, the cameraman came clean. Those lemmings did not want to go over that cliff. Uh, they actually developed a little, which you can't see in the film, a spinning wheel which one of the uh, uh, camera crew were putting lemmings on, and these lemmings had been thrown over the side of the cliff. They didn't want to go at all. The whole thing was uh, fabricated. Absolutely. 
extraordinary. Um, uh, so, you know, it can't be the camera crew going every four years and having this thing. <laughs> right. so, so what was it? What is it that's killing these lemmings? Um, well, it turns out it's mathematics which is killing the lemmings. Which, um, uh, my, my kids, uh, they, they do think maths is deadly. Uh, maybe because I go on too much about it. But uh, they, they can totally believe maths killed the lemmings. Um, but no, there's a mathematical formula which controls the population dynamics. And if we understand this mathematical formula, it gives us some way to understand this sort of periodic behavior. So I'm going to do a little experiment with you. Um, and I, I need a little um, help with this to sort of explore the dynamics of this equation. So uh, we're going to look at simple versions of this equation. So um, the way this equation is going to start is that we start with a population of lemmings and then we're going to double it each season. Um, but the lemmings are not all going to survive. There's not going to be enough food for them all. Um, so the, the formula here controls how many will not survive that generation. So what you do is you take the current generation, multiply it by the previous generation, then divide by 10, and then that will be the number that won't survive. Um, so we, we're going to run this now. So um, we're going to start with two lemmings. So could I have two people who could volunteer to be our first generation of lemmings? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I need you to really get in the mood um, uh, with this. Um, if I'm gonna, I'm going to start picking on people. So I need two volunteers, um, please. Uh, who would like to come and be my first generation? Excellent, good, and uh, good. Yeah, uh, male and female, that's good. We, we do need that to get <laughs> No, no, don't worry, this is a maths lecture, uh, <laughs> it's all theoretical. Um, so we've got our first generation of lemmings, so, so they double up, they have two, two children, so I need two more lemmings to join them. Excellent, wow, that was great class. <laughs> Let's see, this is going to be fun. Um, uh, uh, and so we're going to have four lemmings, but um, how many is going to survive? Well, we, we, we do the formulas of four, current generation, times two, previous generations, so that's eight. Um, uh, divide by ten, so that's roughly one isn't going to survive. So three of you will, one won't. Um, so how am I going to decide this? Um, no, you've not volunteer already, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we're going to do a little um, game of uh, musical lemmings. <laughs> now you're really regretting that you. Um, uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're three survivors, so um, uh, I'll put ten chairs here. Uh, okay. Yes. Come on, guys, you all did bops at school. Uh, in college, so um, uh, just imagine it like the, the, the end of term what? Uh, okay, so, so there are uh, three chairs for you, one of you is not going to survive, okay? So uh, let's cue, cue the lemon music. Cue <laughs> <laughs> up the music. Excellent. Have you three real survive? One won't. So uh, let's see uh, how competitive the good dancers from New College. And give me both strength, but no harm. <laughs> Um, so the next generation, we get uh, three doubles up to six. So, so I need three more volunteers uh, to play the next one. Mark, you want another chance? <laughs> no. Um, so I need three more volunteers, please, to get this. Uh, excellent one. Uh, come on, this is your chance. Two, excellent. And a third volunteer, three, excellent. Here we go. So how many are going to survive this generation? Well, current generation is six. Times three, that's 18, divide by two, that's roughly two, to divide by 10, roughly two won't survive. So uh, six of you, I need another chair. Uh, so here we go, let's uh, make them nice and symmetrical. Uh, that's the other thing I study a lot of, symmetry. Um, so give it, make it very fair. Um, are you ready? Let's cue the lemon music. Another one bust the dust. <laughs> Great two to divide the dust. Four will survive, two waves. Another one bites the dust. Alright, let's see. Yeah. I'm I'm getting getting to you are. So move. The dust is just a run out move for two. <laughs> oh. Alright, right, I've got to see you. Our older generation has been getting filtered out, so we have four survivors. Okay, up you get. Um, four doubles up now to eight. Uh, Eight. So, so I need four more. Your chance. This is your last round. Uh, so uh, four more volunteers. If you want to, uh, to play, then uh, greatest. If you're shaking your head, that means you're coming up. Yes. Yeah, uh, oh, there. Excellent. You're coming up. And and Emily, you're coming up as well. Oh, because, uh, uh, 
She gave me this lovely book, uh, The Nine Chapters. So I, I, I'm really paying you back for uh, uh, giving me such a wonderful book by giving you the chance to dance in front of all your... Uh... <laughs> okay, so now, what's the formula says? So 4 times 8 is 32 divided by 10. We have roughly 3 now that are not going to survive. So uh, there are 8 of you. Um, so we need 5 chairs. Excellent. Great. Let's make a nice pentagon. Um, symmetrical shape. So are you ready? Let's cue the lemon juice. So 10 out of 5, uh, we get 5 left. So interestingly, with this formula, when we double each time, uh, the population of lemmings stabilizes. Um, so let's give our 5 surviving lemmings a great round of applause. <laughs> uh, so when we're doubling the population each time, uh, this is what happens. It stabilizes at what's half the maximum possible uh, uh, population of lemmings. So even if I started with 8 of you, what would have happened, it would have decreased and stabilized at 5 as well. So wherever we started, we'll end up at 5. But now let's try and change the dynamics a little bit. What if the lemmings become a little bit more productive? What happens? Is it always stabilized? Uh, it seems not. If we triple the population and run the same experiments, um, then, uh, well, let's suppose you start with two, um, thumbs up to six, so you end up with five surviving, then it goes to eight surviving, and then it just ping pongs between these two boundaries. So interestingly, when you go to tripling the population of lemmings, um, you get to this uh, periodic behavior. Now let's take it up a little bit more, 3.5. Now we suddenly see what seems to be happening in nature. Uh, the lemmings that were, we, we observe in nature have productivity of about Done, increasing by a factor of 3.5 each generation, you run this uh, feedback formula, um, and every fourth year, the population kind of dips. And that's what we're observing. It's, it's not a suicide pact or camera crew is throwing them off every four years. It's this mathematical formula which is just showing that every four years, the population will drop, and then it will pick up again and do this periodic behavior. <coughs> but what's interesting is if you push it a little bit further, the pattern disappears, and there's a moment threshold moments where if we go up to um, a quadrupling of the population, then suddenly chaos ensues. It's absolutely impossible to predict what this is going to do next. And it's so sensitive, you throw in another lemming, um, then suddenly the dynamics can change completely. Um, so uh, there's, it's very important, again, if you're studying populations of a particular animal to know uh, which region you're in, because at this one you might think there's some environmental factor which kicked in about year 12, 13, or 14. But as you know, it's just the mathematics of this feedback formula um, which will ensure that uh, uh, later on the thing uh, picks up again. So this, uh, it's very interesting in mathematics to, to, to study these kind of threshold moments. So it's a bit like watching water. What's the moment when suddenly it changes its behavior and boils? Um, and actually, this behavior can help you to explain uh, one of the greatest free kicks that was ever taken in the history of football. <laughs> this free kick uh, was taken by Roberto Carlos um, uh, for Brazil against uh, France. Now, uh, Bartes is in goal. Um, you can see how far out this, uh, this ball is. Most people would not put up a wall. Bartes, interestingly, did put a wall up. Um, and, and, and this is uh, what happened. So uh, Roberto Carlos takes a massive run up. Uh, Hits the ball incredibly hard, same thing at the last minute swings the back of the I've got a, another perspective which shows just how extraordinary and why Bartos just thinks, how did that happen? Um, so it looks like it's veering off into the crowd, then right to the last minute, it sweeps around. It's, and this is the best one, you can see people ducking in the crowd because they think it's going to hit them. Um, and uh, then this, this sudden spin at the last minute. So what was going on here? Well, in fact, this is the mathematics of what we saw in the population dynamics, patterns suddenly going into chaos. Uh, Roberto Carlos is clearly a fantastic mathematician because he sat down and showed these equations of turbulence and realized if you hit the ball really hard, uh, what happens is that um, you get uh, what's called a chaotic turbulence. So above a certain speed, there is chaotic turbulence behind here. And that actually causes very little drag 
on a football. So the, the ball flies through the air. In fact, it's uh, the same with golf. Golf seems to almost, when you hit a ball, um, the dimples actually create this chaotic turbulence, and it seems to just hover through. It doesn't seem to come down. And then it's suddenly, at some point, the speed drops for a critical point, in which case the turbulence completely changes behavior. It becomes regular, laminar flow. And that's like a massive drag being put on the football. It suddenly breaks dramatically. And that's when the spin can suddenly take into effect. Uh, and the, the ball flies into the, the side of the net. Um, so absolutely amazing. This, this behavior is responsible. Uh, uh, extraordinary that uh, Roberto, I think we should sign Roberto Carlos for um, Oxford. Um, <laughs> uh, because at its heart, actually, the equations uh, which are behind the turbulence are right behind a football, or the turbulence in oil flying for a pipe, or behind uh, an aeroplane, um, is controlled by equations called the Navier Stokes equations. And there are also equations that we actually are, find very difficult to solve. There's, there's again, a mid, they're one of the mil millennium problems uh, that uh, Landon Clay endowed, um, a million dollar problem. Uh, we still don't know how to solve these equations. Um, but interestingly, I, I think that's what makes mathematics a kind of living, breathing subject, actually. It's, um, it's all the unsolved problems, the things I can't solve, the primes, um, turbulence behind a football, uh, solving uh, equations that to curves and things like that. That's what makes mathematics a living, breathing subject. And it's why it's all the things that we're working on at our wonderful new mathematical institute, which opened um, uh, this year. Uh, you can see this is our entrance uh, to this beautiful building with the Penrose tiles. Um, when you're in Oxford, please come and visit it. It's the, the Rackham and Fermi site. It's absolutely a beautiful building. And uh, getting us all talking to each other in a way, uh, the dynamics of this building is absolutely fantastic. And, and again, it's thanks to um, uh, alumni like you who helped in, endow this building and make it possible, uh, which gives us a chance that maybe we'll make breakthroughs on these great unsolved problems. So thank you very much. some questions. Is, uh, uh, am I chairing the questions? <laughs> um, so yes, I think there's a road of mice. So if, if, if you've got um, uh, some questions, then please put your hand up. Thanks, uh, or answers, if you want to buy any. <laughs> <laughs> if I play a pavilion, uh, I think I've worked out a behind the blinds. Um, oh good, there's a question over here. Can you uh, use uh, the mathematics to predict, for example, like natural disasters, for example, tsunami or earthquake, you know, major flood or whatever? How, how is that applied in, in, in practice nowadays? Well, absolutely. It, one of the big challenges, of course, and, and, but the only way you could ever try and do that is to, to, to do it mathematically. Um, so, uh, you know, but it's about trying to identify, I mean, this is the kind of union of the mathematician and the other sciences, is trying to, uh, uh, as mathematicians, we might have little intuition about the sort of things which might, you might need to keep track of, but um, uh, once you give, give us data, we can often find correlations, and that's what we're very good at, spotting things which are, sometimes things look like patterns and they're not, uh, that's very important to be able to, to pull out the noise, um, uh, and, and so it is about, trying to understand, for example, earthquakes, are, are there key indicators of, in the dynamics of um, the plates that, uh, that you can always use? So absolutely at its heart is spotting patterns. You've got to take the data from each of those previous cases and, and see, is there anything which is giving us a chance? Uh, or again, you, know, you might be able to develop a set of equations and find that uh, they have this essential chaotic behavior in them, in which case um, uh, then, then that's going to be a very difficult position even to use uh, the equations to predict them. But uh, mathematicians are very, working very closely with environmentalists um, in order to be able to, to, to control it. I mean, for example, uh, with, with virus spread or something, it, it's incredibly important to, to run models of what you might expect when a virus breaks out. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I think it was uh, one of the viruses of chicken flu that, um, uh, bird flu, that so they, uh, they ran models to see whether it would make any effects um, if uh, you stopped all international travel. You know, maybe that would contain um, the, the virus spread. Um, and actually, the models showed no, it wouldn't. Uh, even if you cut all international travel, what would happen is that the spread would be slower if you would have the same number of fatalities. So, um, that's, uh, so they decided not to close international travel because it would have such devastating economic effects 
um, and no lives in the long run would have been saved by it. So, so it's very important to apply mathematics to these kind of uh, uh, situations, uh, natural disasters or the things that might happen, because it gives us a chance to see what we could do which might change the behavior or perhaps understand uh, when something won't happen. Uh, question here, yeah. Um, Matthew Willis got uh, some, some cross. Um, you, you mentioned the, the record prime that was discovered using software on a, on a personal computer. Now, I, I, I'm aware that at a number of universities in, in the United Kingdom, um, people are using computers that aren't in use to, to run programs like this. Uh, I remember at, at, at the University of Cambridge um, that they, they had a, in the computer laboratories there, a sort of reset at midnight where they will reboot into Linux. Uh, Crunched, crunched numbers for other departments. Is that something that Oxford is using at the moment to, within the mathematics department or within other research areas? I think what's more interesting that's happening in Oxford um, is actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is not so much, I mean, uh, it is uh, shift and science projects that we're doing, um, which involve people that actually, um, you know, we're not using the human, we're using the computer when we're looking at these points. What I think is more interesting is how we get people actually involved in doing science. Um, you know, that's one of my dreams as a professor for the public understanding of science is not just get people to understand it, but to take part in it. And are there opportunities for people um, to do science even though they may not have a, a science degree? And um, so it's tapping into those problems which actually require humans to, to look at the data. And we have a wonderful example, Galaxy Zoo, um, run from the astronomy <coughs> department uh, by uh, Chris Lintoff and his team. Um, which use, you see, one thing that computers are very bad at, computer vision. Um, so they're very bad at detecting patterns or structure inside a, a visual image. The human brain is absolutely amazing at doing it. So we have so much data coming in from all the telescopes um, that are looking out at the night sky, but classifying what sort of galaxies are out there. So um, the project is actually to take, uh, I mean, I've got a, an app on my, my phone which uh, I, sends me pictures whenever I want, and I just classify, well, that's a, an elliptic galaxy, that's a spiral galaxy. And interestingly, um, these amateurs discovered a new sort of galaxy, uh, which uh, professionals have kind of said, oh, no, that's an anomaly, just about way. But they kept on seeing it over and over again. And um, they're called green pea galaxies, because they look like little green peas um, in these images. Um, and actually, collectively, they wrote a paper, these amateurs, uh, along with uh, uh, people in, in Oxford, uh, uh, classifying this new sort of galaxy, um, uh, which uh, was only observed because humans were looking at all of this data that's been generated. So I think that's the interesting thing. You know, sometimes it's using computers. We had in Oxford um, uh, a climate change thing that we did with the BBC, um, where we needed people to run models of um, uh, different climate uh, uh, um, scenarios and, and all of that data. So it's a sort of parallel processing, which you know, using people out there, the internet gives you that possibility. Uh, the other interesting one with climate change that's happening at Citizen Science Project in Oxford is taking um, uh, uh, records of uh, um, uh, logs of uh, the weather at sea by um, uh, ships across um, the Atlantic uh, over many years. Now that's all written by hand. Uh, a computer has no chance. That's why, you know, uh, it's kind of in inverse Turing tests you get given to show that you're a human, that you can read these little things when you buy a ticket for something. Um, well, actually, that's uh, quite often these things now popped up. They're part of research processes. So every time you, you um, show that you're a human because you could put the letters in, um, uh, well, the similar projects, we, we've got this one going in Oxford where we're taking all of this data that's written in hand in these uh, uh, navigational logbooks. But all that data about the weather is telling us so much more about what how the weather conditions have changed um, at sea um, over decades of time. So, so I think that's, that's a real challenge, finding uh, projects that the public and your computer can be involved. Yes, there's a question at the back there. Um, yep, great. Yeah, sure. Hi, this is a bit of a policy question. Um, I read somewhere recently that the UK is inviting delegations of maths teachers from Shanghai to, um, to, to, to the UK to train teachers in order to try and emulate some of the success in the PISA tests. I'd be interested to know whether you think that is a productive approach to getting children <coughs> interested in and achieving in maths, and if not, what you think the alternatives should be. Yeah, I actually spoke about this on the World Service because it, it became this big thing. I, I think it's incredibly patronising and uh, 
uh, and are totally misguided. It's not, uh, there are fantastic maths teachers um, in the UK, and it's not about bringing, uh, there are fantastic maths teachers in Shanghai as well. Um, and I, I don't think, uh, I, I think it was uh, a really bad move by the British government to, to make that statement. So, and it, it totally um, undermines the great things that are being done in schools. What the problem is, uh, the difference here, I mean, uh, mathematics is given a respect in Asia that it isn't given in Europe. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually a societal change that we need to affect, um, uh, which, it, you know, I don't think any uh, adult in Asia or child would uh, claim that they're, they're bad at maths, even if they are bad at maths. In Europe, this is a badge of honor. It's a, you know, oh, oh, rubbish at maths. <laughs> <laughs> and you may not, but it impresses me deeply that uh, that sort of filters down to children who think that they then don't need to value maths. In Asia, you, you, you already spend a lot of time on mathematics um, in school more. You do it more advanced mathematics. I think that the change that needs to happen in the UK is that we need to challenge our kids more. I actually have just come from Singapore to, talking to a big um, conference, an international baccalaureate conference that was happening in Singapore. Um, 1,200 heads of schools from across Asia trying to encourage somebody to actually um, uh, uh, Try a new curriculum in maths, because I think that uh, the mathematics curriculum, and I think it's a fault in Asia and the UK, is too focused on utility. It's certainly true that mathematics drives a lot uh, of the economy, and that's why um, places in Asia are valuing mathematics and want a mathematically literate society. But actually, most of those applications are coming from people who just love the subject for its own sake. I don't study mathematics. I don't create the new bits of mathematics that I do in my research, because I want it to be useful. I create it because uh, of the beauty of the subject. And so I'm really pushing for, and I've tried to push for the Department of Education in the UK, um, and the door is almost moving, but to create a second uh, course, which is kind of, in, in English, my child, I've got an 18 year old who's been through the whole system, he's done um, English language and English literature. He has to learn the grammar and how to write, yeah, but he also gets exposed to um, Shakespeare, Othello, he did, um, Animal Farm, he gets, now, that's not useful, but it's in totally enriching, and it makes you so fall in love with your language. What we need is a qualification like the, the literature of mathematics, to teach the Shakespeare of mathematics. All the amazing stories that are out there, you can tell if you learn um, the, the, the language of the subject. And so like, like playing a musical instrument, if you just did scales and arpeggios, you'd be bored to it and you'd give it up. If you hear a piece of music, you may not understand how it's written, not be able to play it, but it gives you the inspiration, okay, I want to know how to do that, and you will learn the hard stuff. That's what we need to change in maths, and I think it needs to be changed both in Asia, and because the trouble in Asia that um, uh, the Asian mathematics teachers have told me is that we have great students who can do incredible, uh, you know, apply these algorithms and these systems, but they're very, if they're pushed slightly sideways, um, that creative, imaginative, intuitive side, um, they don't have. Um, and, and so I think that this would help uh, both in Asia and in, in Europe to motivate kids to understand um, why maths is, 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 uh, is so amazing. And, and I really think we need to take the pedal off the, the, the utility and actually go for celebrate, you know, just like in English, we, we expose our kids to Shakespeare. Let's uh, show them Ben Hart Reading, Shakespeare of maths, and uh, show them some amazing stories. But uh, I think we yet to find uh, a country, a government, who's brave enough to, to, to make that step. Just on, on that um, question about um, Asia and numbers, I was just uh, wondering about certain digits or certain numbers have had a lot of influence in different cultures. Um, and the different influence, say, for example, um, in Hindu religion, for example, the number eight, and how it's, it's viewed, and, and, and in China, for example, how it's viewed. So does that, is that a reason of mathematical influence, or is that just something that's grown? I, I think, in some sense, it's very often linguistic. It's about a connection. I mean, in, in China, it's the, um, the, the sound of the word. Um, uh, but, you know, numbers are part of our culture, and therefore, you know, and I think, uh, um, although I would not give any mathematical significance to it, I think, that's, in some sense, it does capture something that I do feel about numbers, which I, I have a personal relationship in some sense with every single number, and I'm interested to explore um, their different characteristics and personalities. Um, now, this is this is what you're doing from um, uh, you know when you hear the sound, but I'm trying to discover things which are, will, are universal across cultures. That um, so you know very famous. Uh, are you from India? Is that your... 
the, oh, okay, right. Uh, I mean, because uh, there's a very famous Indian mathematician that um, uh, uh, Ramanujan who has a lovely story. Um, he was uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, Cambridge, working with G.H. Hardy, and um, he fell very ill in, in London. And um, Hardy came up to to see him, and um, uh, you know, typical mathematicians who are very bad at small talk, and so he didn't know how to comfort. Uh, uh, so, so he kind of told him. Uh, um, uh, the, the number taxi that came in was rather had a very boring number, 1729. And uh, uh, the manager said, no, 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 Hardy, a very interesting number. It's a, the, the smallest number that can be written as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. Uh, 12 cubes plus one cube, 10 cubes plus nine, nine cubes. Uh, and, and that was, he had that kind of personal relationship uh, with numbers. So I, I think it's, it's, it's not so dissimilar, this kind of, um, uh, interestingly, uh, my favorite number 17, as I told you, the one I played right now, football team, um, I uh, was on a, a, a plane uh, a few years ago, um, and I was very dismayed to see there wasn't a row 17. Now, uh, row 13, I know that they exclude those, but row 17, what do they have is my row 17. And, uh, so so I, I tweeted this um, uh, just before I took off. Uh, by the time I landed, I had all of these tweets from Italy. Um, who said you must have been an old, on an old Alitalia plane because um, in Italy 17 is an incredibly unlucky, unlucky number. Why? Because if you write 17 in Roman numerals, it's x v 1 1, and that is an anagram of Vixi. And as you all Oxford alumni will be able to know from your classical education, Vixi means I have lived, which means I am now dead. So row 17 is not a good place to sit. So uh, uh, maybe my 17 shirt is a bad thing to have on my back. Anyway, so um, I think we're going to draw it to a close. That's 4:30. So thank you for a great round of questions.